Jesus' name, welcome to Trinity Lutheran Church because today is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. It is a beautiful day. It's a beautiful day as we come together in this way to worship with each other this day. Oh my goodness, we are at the last Sunday of March. That's right. We're getting close to the end of the Lenten season exactly. as we inch our way towards Easter and possibly spring. Well, I sure hope so. <laughs> A couple sure. of announcements that we wanted to make just in chronological order because there's many things happening at Trinity, which is wonderful. Um, as we'll continue our Lenten worship services on Wednesday evening, if you're able to make it in person, we'll have that meal from 6 to 6.45. 6.45 to 7 is our worship with our special music, guest speaker, uh, which will continue past seven with listening to their story about how their faith in the midst of adversity that they've experienced and any question and answer. Um, but we will continue to publish those Wednesday Lent worship services on YouTube, Channel 2, and Facebook at 7 p.m. Um, each Wednesday, Wednesday leading up to the Wednesday prior to Monday, Thursday. Exactly. And then we are into Holy Week where we will be celebrating Monday, Thursday, and then Good Friday, and then, of course, Easter Sunday. And so just know that for Monday, Thursday, and Good Friday, we'll have in-person service at 7 p.m. and virtual worship at 7 p.m. at the same time. And then Good Friday, in-person worship here in the sanctuary at 7 p.m. and virtual worship at the same time at 7 p.m. on Channel 2, Facebook, and YouTube as well. A lot of things are happening as we move ever so close to the celebration of Easter as the, the things that are taking place and such that is going on. And then just a reminder on April 2nd is Palm Sunday. And on Palm Sunday, we, we are going to be having the passion story that will be shared with us that Sunday. And then lastly, just a capstone, um, many of our announcements, we will have a new member Sunday on April 23rd. Um, that following after Easter um, will be an opportunity for some people to join Trinity here and be a part of our mission and our ministries and help us shape our future as we navigate um, through this season and beyond. And so we're excited to welcome them and accompany them along their faith journey as they'll be a part of our body of Christ and everything that we do to proclaim Christ through word and deed. So if you know of anybody um, that is interested in joining Trinity, please have them give myself Alan or the office a call, um, and we'll make sure that they're incorporated into that event and some of the other new member events that we'll be hosting at the Parsonage. Exactly. So my friends, with all that being said, let us prepare our hearts and minds for worship. Jubilee and I just 
fields are as white in your world And we are the laborers in your vineyard Declaring the word of the Lord Behold ye come, riding by the cloud Shining like the sun Till salvation comes There's no God like Jehovah 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 He comes Riding on a cloud Shining like the sun At the trumpet call And lift your voice It's here at Jubilee And I decide until salvation comes Behold He comes Riding on a cloud Shining like the sun At the trumpet call and lift your voice It's the year of Jubilee And I decide until salvation comes And lift your voice It's the year of Jubilee And I decide until salvation comes I invite you now into our time of confession and forgiveness God, we hear your invitation to us. Come to me, you who are weary and heavy burdened. I will give you rest. We acknowledge our soul's need for rest and quiet nourishment. We lay down our burdens. We acknowledge our soul's need of connection with you. We confess our tendency to overlook rest as a necessary part of soul and self-care. We confess our pride in thinking that our work is so important that we may not set it down. We confess our readiness to believe that what we do determines our worth. We confess our obsession with productivity, results, measurable progress. We confess our tendency to forget that it is in you that we live and move and have our being and that your love is better than life. We ask now for body, mind, spirit, and whole person nourishment. For rest and resurrection, for new life, for healing and consolation of our souls. We ask for help in managing our time and our activities so that our infillings keep up with our outpourings. Where we have overspent ourselves, refresh us. Where we have misplaced our priorities, rearrange us. Where we have said yes when we should have said no, Remind us. We thank you for meaningful work, for blessings and burdens. We thank you for rest. May we become present to our great need for daily bread, the presence of Christ in our lives. Amen. Amen. Hear the good news, the good news of peace and salvation. God forgives us all our sins, not through our own works, but through Jesus Christ risen from the dead. Rejoice in this amazing gift of grace. Amen. Amen. Well, good morning and welcome to our children's message. It's about the story of Lazarus. And I invite you as you hear and see the story come to life to listen to how Jesus was empathetic. He understood sadness, grief, and sorrow connected to losing a friend who died. Or just imagine it be some family member or loved one that we've experienced in our lives as well. So let's see how Jesus interacts with the news of losing a friend. Okay. Lazarus. Three of Jesus' good friends included a man named Lazarus and his sisters Mary and Martha. Jesus was on a long journey when he found out that Lazarus was dying. It took Jesus a few days to travel to see a sick friend. 
When Jesus arrived, he saw Lazarus' sister, Martha. She had some sad news. Jesus, Lazarus is dead, cried Martha. I wish you could have arrived earlier. You might have been able to save him. Jesus tried to comfort her. Martha, don't be sad. Lazarus will live again. Martha believed what Jesus said. Then Lazarus' other sister, Mary, came to greet Jesus. She wished Jesus had come sooner too. Jesus, if you had been here, Lazarus might still be with us, be still alive. She wept. She also believed that Jesus could have healed her brother. Jesus was sad because Lazarus died too. He cried and cried. Jesus, Martha, and Mary went to the tomb where Lazarus was buried. Jesus told some people standing there, take the stone away from the tomb. The people were surprised at what Jesus said. Martha reminded Jesus that Lazarus has been dead for four days. It already made his body ready for burial by wrapping it in special clothes. But Jesus knew what he was doing. He insisted they open the tomb. When the heavy stone was rolled away, Jesus said, Lazarus, come out. The people were frightened and amazed when Lazarus came out of the tomb since his hands and his feet were all wrapped up in the burial clothes. The people had to help Lazarus. When the people saw Lazarus alive again, they laughed and sang and danced. Many people that day believed Jesus would bring new life to all people. Wow, that's quite a story. A story of a good friend of Jesus' that died. Lazarus died. And Jesus was sad. Right. So often, um, Pastor Eric, when somebody that we love dies, we're extremely sad. And uh, sometimes we think it's bad to cry, but yet it's okay to cry. Right. Because Jesus cried. And uh, so for us to grieve and to cry when somebody dies, it's okay. It does not mean you're weak. It means that you are sad. And that you care and love for someone who died. Exactly. And we have Jesus, who's our Lord and Savior, who's empathetic, understands what it means to lose a friend or a loved one. Exactly. And wept and understands what it means to experience sorrow and grief exactly. and sadness. But the exciting part of this story is, is that even in that grief and sadness, <laughs> Jesus showed us who he was, that he is life. And he even says, I am the resurrection and the life, which brings us comfort and assurance that even though someone dies, that Jesus has the ability to raise you from the dead. And that's what resurrection means. And right. that's exciting. Because we are resurrection people. Exactly. And we recognize that our baptisms are a reminder of that. How we are baptized into Jesus' resurrection so that we too may join Jesus in a resurrection like his when he returns. So we'll have that eternal life with Christ and have that reunion amongst our families and the saints that went in front of us and all of our friends as through our faith in Jesus, we accompany each other in that eternal life together in heaven. Exactly. So kids, always remember that this Jesus, he is the resurrection and the life. Amen. Amen. Our first reading for this Sunday is coming from Ezekiel 37, verses 1 through 14. And it reads like this. The hand of the Lord came upon me, and he brought me out by the Spirit of the Lord and set me down in the middle of a valley. It was full of bones. He led me all around them. There were very many lying in the valley, and they were very dry. He said to me, Mortal, can these bones live? I answered, O Lord God, you know 
Then he said to me, Prophesy to these bones and say to them, O dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord God to those bones, I will cause breath to enter you and you shall live. I will lay sinews on you and will cause flesh to come upon you and cover you with skin and put breath into you and you shall live and you shall know that I am the Lord. So I prophesied as he had commanded and as I prophesied suddenly there was a noise, a rattling and the bones came together, bone to its bone. I looked and there was sinews on them and the flesh came upon them and the skin had covered them but there was no breath in them. Then he said to me, Prophesy to the breath, prophesy, mortal, and say to the breath, Thus says the Lord God, Come from the four winds, O breathe, and breath upon these slain, that they may live. I prophesied as he commanded me, and the breath came into them, and they lived, and stood on their feet a vast multitude.
Holy Gospel according to John. Glory to you, O Lord. Now a certain man was ill, Lazarus of Bethany, the village of Mary and her sister Martha. Mary was the one who anointed the Lord with perfume and wiped his feet with her hair. Her brother Lazarus was ill. So the sisters sent a message to Jesus, Lord, he whom you love is ill. But when Jesus heard it, he said, this illness does not lead to death. Rather, it is for God's glory, so that the Son of God may be glorified through it. Accordingly, though Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus, after having heard that Lazarus was ill, He stayed two days longer in the place where he was. Then after this, he said to the disciples, let us go to Judea again. The disciples said to him, Rabbi, the Jews were just now trying to stone you, and are you going there again? Jesus answered, are there not 12 hours of daylight? Those who walk during the day do not stumble because they see the light of this world. But those who walk at night stumble because the light is not in them. After saying this, he told them, Our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, but I am going there to awaken him. The disciples said to him, Lord, if he has fallen asleep, he will be all right. Jesus, however, had been speaking about his death, but they thought he was referring merely to sleep. Then Jesus told them plainly, Lazarus is dead. For your sake, I am glad I was not there, so that you may believe, but let us go to him. Thomas, who was called the twin, said to his fellow disciples, let us also go, that we may die with him. When Jesus arrived, he found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb four days. Now Bethany was near Jerusalem, some two miles away, and many of the Jews had come to Martha and Mary to console them about their brother. When Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went and met him while Mary stayed at home. Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But even now I know that God will give you whatever you ask of him. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Martha said to him, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection on the last day. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. Those who believe in me, even though they die, will live. And everyone who lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? She said to him, yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Messiah, the Son of God, the one coming into the world. When she had said this, she went back and called her sister Mary and told her privately, the teacher is here and is calling for you. And when she heard it, she got up quickly and went to him. Now Jesus had not yet come to the village, but was still at the place where Martha had met him. The Jews who were with her in the house, consoling her, saw Mary get up quickly and go out. They followed her because they thought she was going to the tomb to weep there. When Mary came where Jesus was and saw him, she knelt at his feet and said to him, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. When Jesus saw her weeping and the Jews who had came with her also weeping, he was greatly disturbed in spirit and deeply moved. He said, where have you laid him? They said to him, Lord, come and see. Jesus began to weep. So the Jews said, see how he loved him? But some of them said, could not he who opened the eyes of the blind man have kept this man from dying? And Jesus, again greatly disturbed, came to the tomb. It was a cave and a stone was lying against it. Jesus said, take away the stone. Martha, the sister of the dead man, said to him, Lord, already there is a stench because he has been dead four days. Jesus said to her, did I not tell you that if you believed, you would see the glory of God? 
So they took away the stone, and Jesus looked upward and said, Father, I thank you for having heard me. I knew that you always hear me, but I have said this for the sake of the crowd standing here, so that they may believe that you sent me. When he had said this, he cried with a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. The dead man came out, his hands and feet bound with strips of cloth, and his face wrapped in a cloth. Jesus said to them, Unbind him and let him go. Many of the Jews, therefore, who had come with Mary and had seen what Jesus did, believed in him. The gospel of the Lord prays to you, O Christ. Well, grace and peace to you from our Lord Jesus Christ. This past month or so, I was able to get a book from our local Pelican Rapids library called Spare. I happened to be on hold, and our family was number 55 in line. But it was a book that I wanted to read about because I've seen a lot about Prince Harry on the news, and I've heard him in interviews, and I was just trying to get a better understanding of what was going on. So I went from 55 in line down to one, and Marie picked the book up, and I've been reading it ever since. Now, I'm going to describe to you about Prince Harry, not Prince William, which some of you from the congregation and others have said, I look like Prince William, but we're not talking about him just focused on Prince Harry for this moment. And I wanted to read the book again to learn more about what's going on and also to recognize through someone else's perspective and worldview how they experience life. I thought it would be lighthearted and honestly fun to read this book called Spare, written by Prince Harry. Now, instead, without spoiling the whole book For anyone, I discovered the beginning of the book is really about Harry processing the five stages of grief. Connected to a loved one's death, his mother, Princess Diana. Now, in general, these five stages of grief, through you can see this lens of Harry's experience, includes denial, anger, bargaining, depression, acceptance. And we recognize that these are some of stages of grief and there may be others for certain people and they may not go in an exact order, but generally in one way or another, any one morning the death of a loved one is going to experience that denial, anger, depression, bargaining, and acceptance at some point. And I realized through this lens how death consumed Harry, shaped so many aspects of his life, whether it was being in school, the friends that he had, his relationship with his brothers and his dad, or his brother Prince William and his dad, now King Charles, how he interacted with the nation of Great Britain, and how they mourned alongside him for Princess Diana's death that happened a long time time ago, and many examples came up. For example, talked about denial. He wrote how at some point he thought she was just hiding, that this was her way to escape from the limelight, to go live in a cabin up in the Swiss Alps, and he would, or Princess Diana would reach out to Prince Harry and Prince William later to catch up. So denial was happening. He was angry when he wrote, she's gone, she's dead. Experienced anger. Others that he experienced connected to death with shock, loss of interest. He was distracted in school and learning. Numb. Even went on to describe having a spotty memory. Where he can remember seeing in the places he visited. He can remember walking behind Princess Diana's casket, which we all may have seen videos or pictures of. But he doesn't remember exactly what anyone said during the funeral, what people talked to him before or after her death for a good amount of time. 
experiencing truly this numbing sadness. And he would bounce out of acceptance and in denial where he would have an acceptance in reality of her death connected to when his aunt presented her him with a piece of Princess Diana's hair. It was reality that she was gone. Or maybe she wasn't and would bounce back into maybe Princess Diana is just playing dead and we'll catch up with her later. She needed a break from the scrutiny of the paparazzi and all of the pictures being taken of her life and stories written about her in the news. And then when he would think about the paparazzi again, it would be angry because that was the people that was responsible for her death, causing this car to crash in the tunnel in Paris, France. As I'm reading this, just bouncing from one stage to another, has the stages of grief connected to his mother's death. And it really consumed him for decades. And this book was another way for him to accept that she's no longer there, but that her love has influenced his life profoundly. But there's no doubt about it. Death was a profound way that he experienced the world, particularly because of his mother's death for a very long time. Now, I'm not trying to psychoanalyze Prince Harry. However, I think it's a fair example of how the death of a loved one can consume a person. And after reading the story about Lazarus and reflecting on its meaning, I've come to experience the scripture as Jesus teaching us to navigate in a healthy way through a loved one's death by using our senses, our sense of hearing, feeling, smelling, and seeing to acknowledge the reality of death, to grieve, and embrace our faith in Jesus as a way to navigate through our sorrow. Again, Jesus, in the story of Lazarus, helps us engage our senses to acknowledge the reality of death, grieve in a healthy way, and embrace our faith in Jesus as to navigate through our sorrow. As the word of God in the story can cause us to hear what Jesus teaches us, I am the resurrection and the life. And he says it once, and then he explains it in different ways. I am the resurrection and the life. One way to understand, and it can be translated as, Jesus is the resurrection from the dead and eternal life for all of us, including those he experienced and lived alongside of during his life. The word of God in the story can cause us to feel Jesus' empathetic emotions of weeping over the death of his friends. I remember the first time I realized that Jesus cried for the death of a loved one and how he was modeling for us a healthy way to not bottle up our emotions, which I have historically and culturally done so connected to death because those emotions will come out one way or another, but instead to name them, claim them, cry, and just navigate through our sorrow in the moment amongst family and friends and be sad because that can help us move on instead of putting it on hold because that sadness emotions will come out at some point if we don't just deal with them in the moment. The word of God in the story can cause us to imagine the smell of death of Lazarus, who had been dead for four days. And it was described as you could smell Lazarus from behind the tomb, which covered a cave with a stone. So it's clearly Lazarus was dead. You can imagine the smell of a carcass of an animal or if you've ever navigated through a body. But in modern times, we have ways of getting rid of those smells. But it's described in the story to help us realize the reality of death. And the word of God in the story can cause us to see through the eyes of Mary, Martha, and others how Lazarus was raised from the dead. This life-giving story teaches us about the realities of death while simultaneously expressing how Jesus provides each of us love, promise, and hope by expressing the love Jesus had for Lazarus 
and the love Jesus has for each of us. The promise Jesus delivered in raising Lazarus from the dead and how Jesus promises each of us a resurrection from the dead in the future. The hope Jesus delivered to Lazarus and his family and the hope we can hold on to an eternal life with Christ. And by Jesus doing so, we are better able to focus on him, focus on Jesus, when the topic of death has us either kept us stuck in the past or worrying about the future connected to death. And instead, we are able to engage in the life-giving mission and ministries connected to sharing the good news that Jesus is the resurrection and the life through our words and deeds. This past Saturday, when the Pelican Showcase was an opportunity for leaders and members and families connected to Trinity to share our mission and our ministries in this venue at the high school. Particularly our vision, how we spiritually grow the body of Christ through worship, education, service, and building community relationships, which are all rooted in Jesus' life and resurrection. As Jesus is the resurrection and the life and how that influences everything we do at church. Because we recognize the reality of death. We recognize the difficulties in this world. We recognize the pain, sorrow, and illnesses that exist. And so we acknowledge that, name it, and process it, but then focus on Jesus and pivot towards this reality of Jesus' hope, promise, and love for each of us that he is the resurrection and the life. Jesus is the resurrection from the dead and life at eternal. And so we had pictures showing how Jesus proclaimed through words that he is the resurrection of life during worship here at Trinity. We had pictures showing how Jesus is proclaimed through words that he is the resurrection of life during our education ministries, whether that is our faith in action Sunday school or our circles or our women's Bible studies or our men's Bible studies or our confirmation We have pictures showing how Jesus is proclaimed through deeds, that he is the resurrection and the life during our service for others in his name, whether that was connected to our youth mission trip or us helping people in our community or time in need. And lastly, Jesus was proclaimed through pictures connected to our community, that he is the resurrection and the life when we connect and share Jesus' love with others whether that took place during the turkey dinner or the Thanksgiving meal or the Christmas caroling. Everything that we do here is rooted in the reality that Jesus is the resurrection and the life and his life giving for you, for me, for our church, for this community, and for this world. Because when it comes down to it, all that truly matters in the end is how our faith eternally connects us to Jesus, who provides us resurrection from the dead and life eternal in him. And one day we will enjoy this heavenly reality together, where God will wipe every tear from our eyes, and death and crying and pain will be no more. Amen.
With the whole church, let us confess our faith. I believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Sustained by God's abundant mercy, let us pray for the church, the world, and all of creation. You have breathed into us the breath of life. Enliven your church. Deepen our partnerships with our companion churches around the globe. And bless the work of our missionaries who accompany them. Merciful God, receive our prayer. Your spirit brings life to creation. Enliven the natural world and restore the ecosystems in need of healing. Uplift prophetic voices that turn us to the needs of the soil beneath our feet and the air around us. Merciful God, receive our prayer. You redeemed the world and its people. Free us from the systems of oppression. Raise up leaders at all levels of government who work to promote the dignity of every human life. Merciful God, receive our prayer. You weep when we weep. Be present with those who grieve or who are troubled by the illnesses. We pray this day for Artis Johnson, Charles Nettisted, Megan Harthoon, Ashley Harthoon, Arliss Ellingson, Kathleen Bruns Doppler, Ordine Berg, Dave and Pat Husevi, Gladys Gross, Phoebe and Goldie Thorland, and all others whom we lift before you this day. Merciful God, receive our prayer. Your spirit of life dwells in our assembly. Bless the music ministries of this congregation and all, all who lead us in hymns of praise and thanksgiving and in songs of lament and prayers. Merciful God, receive our prayer. You are the resurrection and the life. Even though we die, we will live. With thanksgiving, we remember all your saints who now live in your eternal love. Merciful God, receive our prayer. We lift our prayers to you, O God, trusting in your steadfast love and your promise to renew your whole creation. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us all embrace each other in Christ's reconciling peace. God's peace, Pastor Eric. Peace be with you, Alan. God's peace be with each of you. At this time, let us give thanks for the offering we receive to proclaim Christ through word and deed here in Pelican Rapids, the state of Minnesota, throughout our country and world. Let us pray. Merciful God, we, we offer with joy and thanksgiving what you have first given us, ourselves, our time, and our possessions, signs of your gracious love. Receive them for the sake of him who offered himself for us, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, 
but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Well, my friends, as we come to the close of this worship service, as we go out into the rest of this day and then the week before us, go with this blessing. May the road rise up to meet you. May the wind be always at your backs. May the sunshine warm upon your faces and the hopefully rains fall gentle upon your fields. And until we meet again, may God hold you in the palm of his hand. Amen. Invite us as we go forth into this week to embrace Jesus who is the resurrection and the life and how that is an important part of our faith journey, recognizing the importance of who our Savior and Messiah is for us and how that's a part of our faith journey. Well, my friends, then go in peace and serve the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. Have a blessed Sunday, everyone. See you next week. God bless.